and change the lives of others by your spirit, that we can see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I always wanted an organ accompaniment. I just <laughs> thought it would be at different points of the service. When I was in high school, I had a group of friends, and we were very, very close. We were almost inseparable, even though we didn't have classes together, at least I didn't have classes with them. Uh, we did all of our extracurricular activities together. We um, ran around together on the weekends, and we all had the same lunches together. And my group, we never ate in the cafeteria. Somebody would always bring a blanket, and we would throw it somewhere on campus, whether it be in one of the courtyards or in one of the hallways, and we would just camp out on this blanket that somebody had brought, and we would have our lunches together, and we were inseparable. And as happens at what, you know, some people would consider a small school for Duval County, and other people would consider vast, depending on what kind of school you go to, um, just rumors started spreading about me and my five or six friends. Rumors that were, at the time, fairly scandalous about things that we did. Now, when these rumors ultimately, again, small school, got back to my friends and I, we just laughed. We just laughed and laughed and laughed because these were utterly ridiculous. And we knew the truth. And frankly, as we were just a few months away from packing up our stuff and heading off and going away to college, we didn't really care what these people said about us. It didn't matter what these rumors were. They were utterly insignificant. Those little sticks and stones really could do nothing to us. And we find Jesus in a similar situation today. Because in our gospel passage from Matthew chapter 16, he has gone off into the realm of the Gentiles, up into the northern regions of Galilee, and then he has gone off far north into the regions of Caesarea Philippi, which is an intensely pagan land. And while he's there with his disciples, he says, guys, Talk to me about the rumors. What are people saying about me? And, hey, as rumors go, these are pretty good, right? Some people are saying, you're Elijah. Well, that's not so bad. Some people are saying that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Some say that you're John the Baptist. These are, are pretty good marks to be, you know, having people say things about you. Right? Uh, you know, these are not nasty things that people are saying. You know, there are far worse things that could be hurled at Jesus and they're saying, oh, you're Elijah, come again. Okay, cool. But then he says, yeah, okay, forget that. Who do you say that I am? And they all just kind of sit there for a moment. And finally, Peter chimes up and says, you're the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And in this, we get one really essential truth. It doesn't matter what the crowd say. It matters what God says. And that is the most essential truth that we can possibly take away from our lessons today. That it doesn't matter what the crowd say, it matters what God says. It matters what God says about himself, and it matters what God says about you. 
And this is absolutely essential that we get this into ourselves. Because what the crowd says is irrelevant at best and harmful at worst. You should have, if you've been with us for a while, you should have heard your ears perk up a little as we read our epistle today from St. Paul in uh, Romans chapter 12. And you should have gone, oh, this is one of Father Scott's dead horse verses. He's just going to beat this one over and over and over again. And rightly so, because it is a fantastic verse. And I could preach Romans 12, 1 over and over and over again. And I kind of have, but I'm going to go with Romans 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We can talk about those rumors and what those voices say, what the world says, both about God and about you, and about what we're supposed to do and believe. And if you don't believe that the world is trying to confuse and mislead and lead you astray, just watch the news for about an hour a day. It doesn't really matter who you're listening to. Half of the country is convinced that the two men who are running for president are babbling idiots. One or the other depends on who you listen to, but both half the countries are telling you that the other guys are idiots. The world is just going back and forth. We're not supposed to listen to that. We're not supposed to be conformed to this world. We're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, both in how we think about God and how we think about ourselves. Because what the world says about us is just as crooked as what it says about God. Because the world wants to sell God short. The world wants to say, oh yeah, Jesus, he was, he was great. I mean, he was great as, you know, a moral teacher, right? He was right up there with Buddha and Muhammad and Gandhi and all sorts of other great people who taught us really good things and we should pay attention to them. But, you know, but God, that's, that's preposterous, right? That's what they say. But I, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. It actually came up on my Instagram timeline this week. And in my meditations, God reminded me of it. And from mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis said, I am trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I am ready to accept that Jesus is a great moral teacher, but I don't accept the claim to be God. That is one thing that we really must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said, would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who said he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he was a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and you can call him Lord. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Someone who walks around claiming to be God and claiming to have the authority to forgive sins is either a madman, a lunatic, or exactly what he says he is. And you can't just call him a great moral teacher. Bono, the lead singer for the band U2, paraphrased this argument and said, he's either God or he's a nutter. I just like that phrase, he's a nutter. Of course, he's not a nutter. He's exactly who he says he is. 
St. Paul reminds us in his pastoral epistles in 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus that we're not to pay attention to the idle babblings or the idle talkers. You can look up idle babblings. We're not supposed to pay attention to that. We're supposed to reject that. We're supposed to pay attention to what is good and true and beautiful. That's part of the reason why every service on Sundays we affirm the words of the creed because that affirms who God actually is. It says, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And we continue and say what we believe about Him and what we believe about the Holy Spirit and the church. Because we're going to affirm those things, we're going to reject the dribble that the world has to say about God. And we're going to say, no, this is what we believe. This is what we affirm. This is what's true. And then we're going to think about what God says about us. And God says, among other things, that we're saints. In Ephesians 2.19, St. Paul says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You are saints. Now that word means consecrated. It means you are holy. You are set aside. You are like the sacred vessels that are up on the altar. You are designated for a sacred purpose. We can't take these and use them at a party to serve punch in. That would be profane. A profane holy things. You are saintly. You are consecrated for a special holy purpose. God calls you saints. And you're thinking, yeah, but I've, I've read about some of those saints. I've read about some of those saints. St. Francis, St. Dominic, St. Ignatius. Those people who led truly godly, holy, saintly lives. God says the same thing about you. And he challenges you to live up to those standards. And you too could live those lives. And that's what we're called to do. Each of us is enabled to do that because each of us has the same Holy Spirit living inside of us. The Spirit that enabled them to do those miracles and live those godly, holy lives lives in each and every one of us. It's not like they had the super high octane Holy Spirit and we're getting the cheap stuff. We can do the same miracles that they did. We can see, live the same holy life that they led. Beyond that, we're sons and daughters of God. Yes. We're his children, and he loves us. St. Paul says in his letters to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 26, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. It's the 21st century. We can say you are all sons and daughters through faith in Christ Jesus. Beyond that, St. John says in his first letter, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we could be called children of God. Think about the love that God has for us, that he calls us his children that we've been adopted by him. He didn't have to do that. But he received us and calls us his children. We who were not a nation, we who were not a people have been embraced by him and he calls us his children. He calls us sons and daughters. He calls us beloved. But there's something even more glorious this is one of my favorite verses. I used to have it on my classroom wall when I was a teacher. 
It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. In the New King James, it says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That word, workmanship, in virtually every translation you go to, it's going to be translated a different way. Sometimes it says, we are his craftsmanship. Some translations it says, we are his masterpiece. The underlying Greek word is poema, the word from which we get poem. We are his poetry. We are his masterpiece. We are his poetry. We are his epic. God is a creator. In whatever way you create, whether you are a writer, whether you are a singer, whether you are a craftsman, whether you do whatever it is that you do create and all of us have something, whether you're a cook, a baker, whether you're a painter, whatever it is that you do that is artistic, think of the masterpiece of your artisanship. And that's how God looks at us. We're not just his children. We're his glorious children. Kathy Shemp, God rest her soul, she used to have a collection of pictures of ugly babies. It's true, she used to laugh about it. She'd tell people, she'd go, uh, what do you call it when you go through the uh, places, the uh, stores that have secondhand stuff? Antiquing. Antiquing, she'd go antiquing, thank you. She'd go antiquing and she'd look for those really old photos of really like shockingly, disturbingly ugly children. And she collected them. You are not ugly babies. You are glorious. God loves you. He looks at you and you are his masterpiece. He adores you. He loves you. You are glorious in his sight. He looks at you and says, I done good. He is impressed with his workmanship over you. Now, realize that these truths that God imparts in Holy Scripture, these truths that he reveals both about himself and about you, are not just for your sake. Because that's what's important about Scripture. It's not just for us, it's for the sake of the world. It's important that we understand it, but not just so that we can go around being content that we have secret knowledge that no one else has. Walk around, little puffed up, saints. We know something they don't know. No, that's the opposite of what Romans says. Romans chapter 12 calls us to be humble, to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, to not be puffed up that we have some secret knowledge. In fact, we're called to share this knowledge with other people. You're going to say, Father Scott, the last passage from the gospel said Jesus strictly told them not to tell anybody about this. That was before he was raised from the dead. After he was raised from the dead, he told them to tell everybody. It's the whole point of Acts. Tell everybody. Tell the whole world. He told them not to tell anybody before he was raised from the dead. After he was raised from the dead, he said, let everybody know. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to share with people that they are called to be sons and daughters of God and that they're called to be glorious. And God doesn't make ugly things. We're called to give people hope and glory and a vision of the future where they're loved and accepted because the message of the gospel is reconciliation with God the Father who created them and loved them and restored them and redeemed them. It is a message of love and hope. And it's not just for us, 
Because we need to hear it. We need to have that love of God poured into our hearts. But once we've accepted it, we need to give it to other people. Because there's a whole world that's lost and dying, and the world tells them that that's fine, because there is no God, and the people who believe it are crazy, and all sorts of other names. But we know the truth, and we're not called to keep that truth a secret. We're called to share that truth. Because that truth is the only truth that sets us free. That truth is the only truth that heals and restores and frees. And we have to share that with others. And having been set free by this incredible, abounding love of God, let's share that love with everybody who will listen to us for half a second. Amen? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hey, this is Father Scott Loco with Church Messiah. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and you got something out of it, please click the like button below. And also, you can click the subscribe button to get notifications in your inbox when we post other videos in the future. You can click the little bell below and you'll get uh, notifications also. So do that and uh, we'd appreciate it. So thanks. God bless you. We appreciate it. Uh, pray for us and we'll be praying for you. God bless you.